Uh, welcome to our virtual science cafe. We've been holding science cafes in one form or another since 2008 when the then Dean of Science instituted them so that Carlton's amazing science researchers could talk about their work to the amazing community that supports the university as a whole and in many cases since you've selected to be here, science research in particular. And it's been a success. It started at the Wild Oat Cafe, outgrew that space, moved to the uh, Ottawa Library. And we were just threatening to outgrow that space as well, when of course we had to move to online. And we haven't outgrown Zoom yet, but I'm hoping the news is optimistic that we will move at least to in-person as well as potentially virtual uh, sometime in the next foreseeable few months. Today's cafe is uh, on a subject that really does tie into COVID, although it isn't about COVID, which is rather nice because I think we've had a lot of about COVID over the last year. Our speaker, Alfonso Abizé, got his uh, bachelor's, master's and doctorate in psychology at Concordia University, where he won the Governor General's Award for the top a PhD in his year. The National Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada then gave him a postdoctoral fellowship that he was able to take up at the Yale School of Medicine. And then Carleton's win, he came to work for Carleton and is now part of the uh, neuroscience department. And little plug for Carleton, we're one of the few universities that has a full undergraduate department for neuroscience rather than burying that in a uh, psychology department. He studies brain processes and in particular how we interpret cues from the environment and how we regulate feeding and energy and has a particular interest in hormones such as ghrelin which are linked to our reward system and how we pursue feeding as a reward mechanism uh, for or to help us allow us to cope with uh, social stress and how this may tie into prenatal factors. I've decided we'll give him the benefit of the doubt and not accuse him of staging COVID as a massive experiment. Um, and I think that's probably realistic and true since I'm somewhat familiar with the ethics committee at Carleton and I know we'd never get that one by them. Uh, but the tie in to social stress and eating is obvious and I'm sure you can all uh, all see that. Alfie also plays the harmonica and he claims to be the oldest player on the Carlton Intramural Soccer League and he also claims to be the sole reason that they send the emergency first aid responders to all of his team's games. So hopefully we won't need any emergency first aid but I will turn the uh, screen over to Alfie to present a talk on evidence for his and our gut feelings about stress. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Pam, for the really kind introduction. And uh, I really, I, th I thought it was really funny. And, uh, and uh, uh, I thank you for it. I am going to start sharing my screen uh, and take you to my presentation, uh, which is entitled A Gut Feeling About Stress. Uh, now, before I do get started with the nitty gritty of this presentation, I do want to acknowledge, uh, as Pam said, we have a fantastic uh, neuroscience department and our research, a lot of the research that I will be presented to you is, is, is really conducted by my students at all levels, uh, is conducted by my uh, really bright uh, graduate students. A lot of what I will talk about uh, is, was work conducted by former students that are not listed here, although I will be mentioning them as I go along. Uh, but these are my current uh, students. I will talk a little bit about the work of Andrew Smith at some point, um, and also the work of some of my, uh, you know, uh, current undergrad students. So you can see that my lab is a, is a pretty large lab, and as well as uh, I benefit from the collaboration uh, uh, with, uh, you know, some of my former mentors, current mentors, and and really people that I respect in the field within my department as well as uh, uh, outside of uh, Carleton. Uh, and it's funded by some of uh, uh, you know, Canada's uh, uh, funding uh, mechanisms, including NSERC, CIHR, uh, CFI, Canadian Foundation for Innovation, and the Ontario Mental Health Foundation. 
uh, so I'm really grateful to to them and and of course to all of you that pay your taxes and make that funding possible for us to do that so so I'm extremely grateful for that um, so I will begin by uh, uh, sort of talking a little bit about stress uh, because really this is this is uh, uh, stress is something that is omnipresent right we are never going to get a, a away from stress stress is part of life and our body has essentially uh, we have evolved all organisms really have evolved mechanisms that have to deal with stress because after all stress is sort of anything that throws us off uh, this very fine delicate balance uh, in terms of physiological mechanisms, in terms of psychological mechanisms. In humans, those psychological me mechanisms are always there, right? Because um, if you think of a zebra that is being attacked by a lion in the savanna, right? That zebra is going to be concentrating on that lion. But if, if the zebra survives the lion, a few hours later, it might still remember the lion, but it's just going to be sort of relaxing. Whereas uh, in our case, we may be uh, exposed to say, crossing the street, a bus, an oncoming bus, but if we get away from that bus and we may survive it, then for the rest of our lives, we may have this reminiscent memories of the bus coming at us and, you know, and what would happen if the bus hit us and would we be covered for medical expenses and would we be able to retire or would we be able to, you know, would we be incapacitated? Would we be able to pay our mortgage? Would our kids go to university? So you see that the, the sort of thoughts and processes that occur in humans are a lot more complicated than those of a zebra who doesn't have a mortgage and and and, and university bills to pay after after the attack from the lion. So. So those sort of uh, uh, stressors, all, all of these uh, uh, environmental changes can be physical and real, or they can actually be imagined and predicted and perceived. And the psychological factors are often as strong stressors as those very real uh, environmental factors that can challenge us. Um, but what's really important to note is that at least in, 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 all, in, in all vertebrates, in all animals that have bones, bone structures, including mammals and, and ourselves, um, we have very basic mechanisms that have evolved to deal with this sort of very, you know, acute uh, changes in the environment. And, and, this, uh, and these mechanisms are what we call the stress response, right? And we have this very rapid stress response, which is produced by the sympathetic nervous system. So when we see something threatening, our heart rate goes up immediately, our respiratory rate goes up, our liver just throws all of this uh, uh, glucose out in the blood system so that we can uh, you know, run away or defend ourselves when an impending attack. Uh, and, and all of these very rapid processes occur before we're even consciously aware of, uh, of the particular danger or threat uh, or at the same time as this is occurring. And, um, and then a little later, you'll have this endocrine response where you have the release of a, a, of a peptide from the hypothalamus called CRH that stimulates a hormone from the pituitary called ACTH. And that hormone then gets to our adrenal glands, which will produce the hormone cortisol. And many of you are familiar with cortisol. If you, if you uh, uh, have at least studied the very basics of psychology and, 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 and the psychology of stress, you will have heard about cortisol being the, the, the marker of a stress response, right? If you collect saliva from people that have been stressed, you will see that they're cortisol levels go up. And those are really important because cortisol is a, is a hormone that is an anti-inflammatory, right? It prevents from inflammation. So if you get injured, it helps with that. It's a hormone that is called a glucocorticoid because it also allows you to generate energy from carbohydrate stores in your system so that you can, again, continue to fight or run, you know, generate that energy. Um, but the most important part of cortisol is that it also feeds back into the brain and that feedback is important to shut the whole thing off so that you don't have these responses chronically elevated. So, so it's important for dealing with the stress, but it's also a sort of like a step forward to turning off the response. And the ways in which these, uh, and these responses are, you know, what, what people classically understand as the typical stress response, whether it's a stress response to, uh, you know, a, a, an impending boss coming at you or your child telling you that they skipped classes, you know, like my child just did that, um, that they skipped a couple of classes and, and they didn't show up to school is the same response that we get, right? So what I want to argue today to you is that there's another, another hormone that is equally important, perhaps even more important than cortisol uh, for dealing with the stress response and that will show you how uh, the mechanisms by which this hormone, which we call ghrelin, 
those uh, 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 similar things right through alternate pathways, through a, a different pathway. Um, and I call the presentation the 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 uh, I got feeling about stress because essentially this hormone, uh, which is called ghrelin, is actually produced primarily by the stomach, by the gut. Um, and uh, uh, this is a, 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 the chemical structure of the, of the hormone is a peptide. Peptides are these little short chain, chains of amino acids. Uh, it goes through a number of transformation. But what's really important to know is that uh, after all of these different chemical transformations, you have this little peptide with a little, you know, a uh, uh, molecule of fat attached to it here. Uh, this is a, a fat called octanoic acid and you get this from your diet. And uh, once that, that modification has occurred, the, the, the peptide goes live, right? This is when it has its effects. And the, the effects that ghrelin has when, uh, you know, when this hormone gets into circulation and it binds to its receptors all over the body, uh, the main effect that, that uh, the classical effect that people report in the textbooks is that it increases food intake, right? It makes animals eat and people. So if you inject a person with ghrelin and people have done these experiments, they will not only report increased hunger, but they'll actually report vivid imagery of their favorite foods like ice cream or, you know, those blizzards that people, you know, for me, it would be that Sublaki from, uh, you know, Cosmos or Go for Greek near my neighborhood. So I'm putting a plug to the local businesses, go to those places, they're really good. And so anyways, uh, so, so it's not only a hormone that increases hung, hunger and appetite, it increases appetite for those things that we really crave, that we really like. Um, and at the same time, it's a metabolic hormone. It decreases your metabolism, it decreases the amount of energy you spend. And, it, uh, and one of the most important things as well, just like with corticoids, it promotes the use of carbohydrates. And, and, and this is again important because carbohydrates are cheap energy to burn. Cells burn carbohydrate uh, with more ease, metabolically speaking, than they would burn a molecule of fat. So when you're stressed, it would make sense to burn carbohydrates uh, instead of fat. And glucocorticoids do this and ghrelin does this, but the problem with that is that if you're only burning uh, carbohydrates, uh, if you're eating a diet that contains both sources of nutrients, right? and you're only burning the carbohydrates, well, what happens to your fat? You know what happens, I know what happens. You accumulate it in your, body, in your fat stores and you gain weight in the form of fat. So that's what ghrelin does. It's a, it's a metabolic hormone and it also increases the intake of foods. Now, if, if we look, and these are just uh, uh, sections from, from different rodents. These are, these are from studies done on rats. These are, these are not from my lab, but these are some of the first uh, sort of uh, studies done on this uh, that really drove my research at the time when we were reading the studies. And we find that the, uh, this little black signal that you see here, these are what we call coronal sections. So if you take a brain from the front to the back, you slice it from front to back like a, like a salami kind of, right? Uh, you will find that at the bottom of the brain here, you have a structure called the hypothalamus, which is really important for for feeding and reproduction, right? And this black signal that you see here is a, is a signal for the, uh, uh, for the receptor for ghrelin. And uh, you can see that the receptor for ghrelin is densely expressed in the hypothalamus primarily. Uh, uh, you can see high expression in the hypothalamus. These are rats and these are mice. But the other thing that is really interesting is that uh, uh, it's not only expressed in areas that are important for feeding, uh, but also in areas that are important for the stress response. And one of these areas, for example, is this region called the paraventricular nucleus. This is where CRH, uh, the, the CRH hormone that starts the stress response is produced. Um, and you also have areas of the brain, like um, if you notice uh, right down at the, at the back of the brain here, uh, you have an area called the ventral, VTA here stands for ventral tegmental area. Uh, and the substantia nigra compacta, both of which contain neurons that produce the neurotransmitter dopamine. And what was really uh, exciting for me to see when I first read this paper uh, was the fact that I knew that these dopamine neurons were actually uh, critical for the uh, 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 critical for for human and animal uh, uh, generation of uh, reward-seeking behaviors and and. And uh, seeking behaviors for all kinds of rewards. They can be food, they can be sex, uh, they can be drugs of abuse. Uh, these uh, neurons within these two structures, these dopamine cells are critical for that. And it was really exciting to see that they had the receptors for my gut, you know, for this beautiful gut peptide that I studied. 
so that really sort of uh, uh, started driving my research and 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 uh, uh, what's also important to note is that this region is also critical for the stress response because during continuous stress, the activity of these neurons is actually a little bit suppressed and it becomes suppressed over time. And that's what leads to, uh, um, in, in, in conditions like depression, right? It can lead to uh, the decrease in dopamine release from these regions can lead to what we call anhedonia, uh, the inability to liking things that we normally you know, that we normally like. The people that suffer from depression, usually that would be one of the sort of uh, keystone uh, uh, symptoms that they complain about. So, um, so following up on these data, we started doing, and this is, this, this is work that was conducted by a, a student of mine uh, uh, who is now a, a faculty in our department and a collaborator of mine. His name is, doc, is Dr. Zachary Patterson, also a, a graduate from the uh, uh, Integrated Sciences that, uh, program that Pam Wolf led a, a while back. Uh, so it's really a, a homegrown, uh, homegrown uh, individual and scientist. Uh, he started doing experiments where he was measuring um, uh, ghrelin levels in animals that were put in situations that, uh, that were stressful for them. And these situations included this, uh, this sort of animal model where you essentially put an animal, you take advantage of the fact that uh, uh, male mice are very territorial. They don't like other mice in their, in their, in their enclosure. So if you, if you put in an experimental mouse in the box of the other, of the other mouse and you let them interact, this mouse will constantly be trying to get to the other side and attacking this guy. So we have a separator here. Uh, most, of the, uh, most of the interactions are like this, psychological. So, so we do let them interact for about five seconds every day. Um, but in general, they're constantly separated, right? And generally, this particular procedure uh, is, is stressful for this animal. It's like living with a bad roommate. Um, uh, it's like being in an office and the, and, the, and, the, and the person next to you is constantly, you know, uh, abusive. Or, or if you're in a, in a, in a, in a, in a school, uh, in a school setting where you have a child that is being constantly, you know, berated and aggressed on, um, it's a model of this, right? Um, and when you do this, you, you obviously do see uh, changes in the uh, uh, stress response that I described earlier. But what Zach Patterson, Dr. Patterson found was that when we did this for a period of three weeks, right? So when these animals live together for a period of three weeks, the animals here, the experimental animals show you an increase in ghrelin. And this was an increase in ghrelin that uh, was up regardless of the time of the day in which you were collecting the samples. And uh, other collaborators of mine have actually shown that if you do this for, for three weeks and you measure the ghrelin levels months after the last stressful interaction, those levels remain up for, for months, right? They stay up. Um, so this was, again, very interesting because it seems that like glucocorticoids, ghrelin levels are chronically elevated uh, by, by, you know, this sort of chronic stress response. They're also elevated, by the way, by acute stressors. And we've done this in the lab, even with human subjects, where we use a, a psychological test called the, uh, the tiered stress test, where we tell university students that they are going to be giving an oral presentation. Uh, that you ask them to participate in a study, and as part of the study, you tell them, you give them a piece of paper containing information, and then you tell them, oh, by the way, you're going to be doing a presentation on this in 10 minutes in front of a panel of experts. Uh, when you do this to, to, to participants, uh, and then you take a blood sample from them, you will find that their ghrelin levels, you know, within 25 minutes are elevated just as cortical, uh, as cortisol levels would be elevated. So it is a stress response. It can be acute, it can be chronic. Uh, and the, and, the, uh, and uh, the effects of that increase are also reflected in the behavior of these little guys. Um, so if you look at the behavior of these little guys, this is uh, uh, their mean caloric intake. These animals have a choice of a high fat diet as well as a regular diet. When you measure the intake of all of these diets, what you see is that uh, these animals, the animals in yellow, which are the stress animals, at the beginning of the stress, you see this little drop in, in food intake, but then they go, their food intake goes up. And in average, it increases about 10% over the period of stress. When the stress ends here, you can see that it stays elevated for a few days and then it goes back to normal here. 
Um, so, so essentially, ghrelin, uh, the, the increased ghrelin levels are correlated with this behavioral response. And if we look at the intake of the diets, right, specific diets, one of the things that we were totally blown away by this is that we were expecting to see that the high calorie diet was going to be the one that was preferred. We actually see a drop in that diet, right? So they do prefer it uh, in the baseline period, but when the stress starts, they go down. Um, and the other diet, the regular chow diet, which is 70% carbohydrates, right? So it's really a, a, a breakdown in the energy that these, uh, in the nutrients that these diets have. That's the diet that they are increasing, is the diet that has the most sugars. Um, and this is the one that they prefer. And as soon as the stress is down, they go down on this one and then go up in the high fat diet. We'll discuss that if anybody has questions about this, but we think that this is an effect of, uh, of the fact that during stress, the animals are burning carbohydrates and they're overeating this diet because they're essentially replenishing their carb stores uh, to do this. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we also see that because they're utilizing carbohydrates, their body weight increases. And uh, uh, we've done studies where we actually look at the fat uh, distribution and uh, fat uh, content increases in stressed animals. Zach then went on, uh, we, uh, we had access to, through some collaborators, to an animal. Uh, these are uh, genetically engineered animals that don't have ghrelin receptors. So uh, we have these animals in our facility. And essentially what Zach was trying to see is, you know, if they don't have the receptors, will we see the same responses, right? Because then we can link them to ghrelin and its ability to bind to its receptor. And just as expected, these are your normal animals. These are your animals without the ghrelin receptors. These are your stress animals. So your stress animals gain as much weight. Uh, they increase their caloric intake. Uh, and what's interesting is that, and again, they increase their ghrelin levels, but the animals that don't have ghrelin receptors uh, don't show you an increase, a significant increase in weight gain. They don't show you a significant increase in their caloric intake. Um, and this is in spite of both groups of animals showing you increased uh, 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 corticosterone, which is the the equivalent of cortisol in, 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 in rodents. Uh, so in spite of both animals showing you increases in glucocorticoids, right, they're not showing you the same increases in food intake and body weight. So this leads us to believe that what we're seeing here, this increase in food intake and weight gain is due to the effects of ghrelin and not to the effects of glucocorticoids. So why is this increase important? And that was a question that another one of my students uh, uh, asked. Um, um, but primarily, uh, one of the questions that we wanted to, to, to also understand is like, is because we know that ghrelin, uh, to a certain extent, is produced primarily by the stomach, and we wanted to see whether there was something happening during the stress response in the ability of ghrelin of getting into the brain. And this is work that uh, uh, one of my, my current students in the lab, uh, I'm sorry about that, uh, her name is Andrea Smith, uh, she's here at the top of my uh, screen. Uh, Andrea did a really bright experiment where she looked at animals that had been uh, uh, stressed uh, and she used a, a labeled form of the, ghrelin, uh, of the ghrelin peptide. So she injected these animals and then we were able to visualize what happens uh, after seven, seven minutes after the injection, 15 minutes and 30 minutes. And what you can see is that in a non-stressed animal, uh, within seven minutes, you have the highest amount of signal of this labeled ghrelin entering the brain, right? Um, but in the stress animals, the, 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 the animals that have been stressed, they show you a lot more signal after seven minutes. That signal is still elevated within 15 minutes, and then it just starts to decrease after 30 minutes, suggesting that the stress is not only causing an increase in ghrelin secretion, but also uh, uh, an increase in the ability of that ghrelin to get into the brain uh, and infiltrate the brain to have uh, increased action. Why, why is that important? Why would we want uh, an increase in ghrelin and an increase in, in, in food intake that is produced by ghrelin? Uh, and this are, this are, uh, uh, these are studies that were conducted by Trevor Rodriguez, a former student in my lab, now working at uh, CIHR. And what Trevor did is a, is a very simple experiment, right? He wanted to see, well, why is it important to increase your food intake when you're stressed, right? I mean, we do it all the time, right? We, we're talking about COVID and how it's made us all go and cook all these fancy meals and, and uh, uh, empty, the, the, empty the, uh, the, the stores out of flour, right? So why is it good to eat all of those carbohydrates, right? 
So what, uh, what uh, Trevor did was a study where he had three groups of animals, one group of animals that were not stressed, a group of animals that were stressed and were allowed to overeat, right? And then a group of animals that were stressed but were not allowed to overeat. So they were only given the same amount of food that the control animals that were not stressed were eating. And as you can see, uh, uh, these are uh, corticosterone levels in, in all of these animals. And as you can see, the animals that are not allowed to increase their caloric intake, right? So, so those animals that are not allowed to go to the supermarket and buy their flour, the extra flour, are the ones that are having a massive corticosterone response. Uh, the, also, the ghrelin levels are much higher as well, but their glucocorticoid response is much higher. It's almost like they can't keep uh, glucocorticoid levels down, that that uh, uh, negative feedback that is required to bring cord levels down so that they don't become toxic is not, is not there. So in fact, what this data suggests is that you need to eat those extra calories to keep that stress response down. Um, so that's what I'm going to go for. Now that, and that's what I explain to my wife now when I eat that extra plate of spaghetti and just dealing with my stress uh, and it's helping me out. And it might help you out in the short term. Um, so what is driving this? Um, and from the time in which I was hired, uh, one of uh, this, I call this my 15 minutes of fame. Uh, this was a paper that, that I published uh, uh, when I got to Carlton, but it's work that we did in my, P, in my postdoc. Um, we had discovered essentially, as I told you before, that the ghrelin receptor was found in these reward-related regions right, the ventral tegmentar area and the substantia nigra. This is signal for the receptor. So this is binding of ghrelin with this fluorescent tag. This is a receptor assay that we can run in the lab. And this is a, a fluorescent assay where we can co-stain the receptor using antibodies and uh, uh, that detect the ghrelin receptor and also using antibodies that detect marker for dopamine cells. And what we find is that there's good, you know, they, they are co-localized, they are expressed in the same cell, suggesting that dopamine neurons are sensitive to, recept to, to ghrelin. And if we record from these cells, when we have these essays, uh, where we look at their tissues, and we, uh, uh, we do this, uh, uh, this technique called uh, um, electrophysiology, where we can see the activity of these neurons, right? So we measure the activity of the neurons on their normal conditions. So this is this here, and then you throw in ghrelin, you can see that the activity increases massively, right? And then as ghrelin is washed out from the media, the activity of the cells drops down. Um, so, so essentially, uh, uh, these cells are sensitive to ghrelin. They get stimulated by ghrelin. Uh, uh, I'm not going to explain this part, but this part essentially indicates that they also change in a way that they have plastic changes that make these cells to be more activated, more likely to be activated by all kinds of stimuli. So, so ghrelin enhances the sensitivity of these neurons uh, and it makes them more active, suggesting that ghrelin may be producing increases in, in, in reward-seeking behaviors, which may explain why they go for more food, right, when, they, when animals are stressed. Uh, and again, interestingly, another, a student in my lab, uh, uh, Sue, Sue Bin Park, uh, also discovered that if you took uh, the ventral tegmental area of animals that were stressed, Right, um, uh, and you look for the, and you were, and, and you quantified the receptors, uh, uh, you would find uh, that animals that are stressed, and again, regardless of which time of the day we're looking at this, animals that are stressed have more receptors for ghrelin in that area of the brain, in the ventral tegmental area. So stress seems to be sensitizing this, this dopamine cells, right, to be more sensitive to, you know, to, to, to the effects of ghrelin. So one of the uh, one of the experiments that we decided to do uh, uh, these are these were two very bright undergraduates in my lab, Carolyn Wallace and, and Karen Mazer, uh, who did their honors thesis with me. And in their honors thesis, they did experiment. They did experiments where we had animals that were stressed and non-stressed, but some of these animals were receiving this drug. Uh, it's called Dilys GHRP6. It's a it's an antagonist, so it blocks the effects of ghrelin. Uh, and this drug was delivered directly into the VTA of stressed and non-stressed animals. These are the controls. You can see that our stress animals are increasing their caloric intake, but are not. And but the stress animals that get the drug, they don't increase that caloric intake as much. They do still do it, but not as much as the animals that are just getting the the placebo drug. Um, now this is interesting because it tells you that maybe these feeding responses are driven by the VTA. 
But when they looked at the behavior of those animals, they also showed that the animals that were getting the ghrelin receptor antagonists in the VTA were showing uh, uh, behavioral responses that are very similar to social anxiety. So if you put them in a box and you present them with a novel animal in front of them, uh, control animals within 10 seconds will go and investigate that, uh, that, that novel animal. But the animals that are getting the drug into the VTA, they're taking nearly five times as longer to approach suggesting that they're afraid of them, right? Uh, and this tells you again why the, the importance of ghrelin, right? So maybe ghrelin is important for, uh, is important for uh, um, the increases in ghrelin and food intake may be important for the coping responses that are uh, necessary to maintain a normal behavioral repertoire. And if you block the effects of ghrelin, you may have uh, a dysfunction uh, in, some of the, uh, in some of the behavioral responses that are associated with you know, normal function, like social interactions. Um, Sue Bain went on to check on that. She just looked, these were animals that were not stressed at all, uh, either wild types or knockouts. Um, and that what she found is that in general, animals that don't have ghrelin receptors are very shy in approaching other animals. Uh, so it seems again, you know, again, this is the latency to approach a novel animal, how much they investigate that animal. So if you don't have ghrelin receptors, uh, if, if you have animals that don't have ghrelin receptors, you have animals that are less likely. That show, they, they're, more, they're showing a, a behavioral uh, response that people have linked to social anxiety, right? Um, and uh, uh, really, this is one of my favorite studies ever conducted in the lab. This was conducted again by, uh, by Sue Bin and another former, very bright former student in my lab, Samantha King, I'm uh, now working at the Canadian uh, Center for uh, uh, Drug uh, for Substance Abuse. And uh, Sam and Subin uh, did a study where they took some of these knockout mice and they used genetic engineering techniques to rescue the receptor only in this region of the ventral tegmental area using uh, viral vector techniques and, 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 and you know, technology that I'm not gonna explain right now. But essentially what they're doing is rescuing the receptor in these mice that don't have it, they're in reintroducing the receptor only in the region of the brain called the VTA. And when they do this, uh, and if we look at the behavior of these animals, uh, these are your wild type animals uh, uh, getting a, 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 just a, a virus that you know, makes everything fluorescent. That's just to make sure that we show that the uh, procedure is not causing them to behave differently. Um, and these are your knockout mice that don't have the rescue. So you can see that their latency to approach a stranger is still quite long, right? And these are the mice that have the rescue. So these are the mice where we have rescued the receptors only in that area of the brain, the ventral tegmental area. And we are making them behave like the control animals, which leads us to believe that, uh, uh, and this is the, the amount of investigations is not statistically significant, but it's trending in the right direction. So essentially what um, our data are saying is that uh, um, social stress causes uh, uh, an, increase in ghrelin, uh, an increase in ghrelin secretion, and this ghrelin uh, leads to an increase in caloric intake. Now the caloric intake is important because it essentially attenuates the activity of this stress response, right? It seems being able to, to eat those extra calories when we're stressed it's actually keeping our stress responses down. Um, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, perhaps helping us deal with the stressor in the short term. In the long term, it might not be helpful because then we develop other secondary side effects, right? If we're accumulating fat, if we're accumulating, uh, 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 if we're slowing down our metabolism, if we are overeating, then over time that may lead to other issues. And, and Zach's done, Zach Patterson has done uh, really great work showing that, uh, that can lead to obesity, insulin resistance over prolonged periods of time. Uh, but in the short term, it may actually lead to, to, to reducing the activity of the HPA axis and, and help us cope in the short term. Um, and then uh, uh, the receptors for ghrelin, they're found in a number of regions of the brain, but specifically those found on the BPA uh, may be important for integrating uh, some of these feeding effects and the anxiolytic effects of ghrelin, because after all, ghrelin seems to be an anxiolytic drug. It's a drug that turns down anxiety, and perhaps it does so by this increase in appetite and this increase in caloric intake. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the receptors in these dopamine neurons may be very important in, in sort of mediating these effects. 
so with that, I I, uh, uh, I want to finish with that. Uh, I don't have an answer in terms of uh, uh, you know what can we create or what uh, in terms of pharmaceutical approaches. Uh, it is very difficult to 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 sort of put a target when you have. Um, effects in areas of the brain where if you modulate it too much on one side, you get, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of in enhanced motivational process uh, that can lead you to overeating and, and obesity, whereas if you modulate it on the other side, you can get to depression. That's kind of our challenge, right? Finding the right balance in all of these, in all of these things. But uh, at the very least, we're getting an idea of uh, untangling uh, the effects of this hormone in the brain and how uh, potentially we can, we can start seeing uh, drugs that can modulate the activity of uh, specific sets of neurons uh, without affecting what happens in the rest of the brain, uh, which would be something ideal if we don't wanna disrupt metabolism, for instance. Giving something that enhances the activity of the ghrelin system in the BTA while not enhancing what happens in the hypothalamus, which is where ghrelin produces obesity, uh, would be ideal and uh, is something that we're looking into. Uh, at this point, I'd like to welcome uh, any questions. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, excited and curious to see what people think, and, I'm, and I hope I can answer your questions at this point. Um, thank you. Thank you. That was fascinating, and I'm sure we all have a round of virtual applause. It always feels very funny at the end of an online, uh, online talk to have the silence that would normally be applause, and thank you. Uh, there are some questions in the Q&A. Uh, the first one, I believe, was answered, but I will ask it, and maybe Alfie can um, sort of summarize the answer again. And uh, there was the question, is there a blocker for ghrelin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so in the, uh, I guess, in the, in the drug pipeline, there, there's a number of drugs that, that people are trying to create. And, and we have to understand that ghrelin is, a, as I said, it's a, the classical effect is this appetite effect, right? Uh, so a lot of people are trying to generate drugs that block ghrelin to decrease appetite as diet drugs, essentially, um, with, with the unfortunate drawback that, you know, the, a side effect of blocking many, not just ghrelin, uh, you know, not, not just ghrelin related drugs, but even, for instance, cannabinoid related drugs and, 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 and many other sort of targets. Uh, the problem with blocking appetite is that you also have the problem of developing depression. And one of the side effects of drugs that block ghrelin receptors uh, is this sort of uh, depressive phenotype, right? So this is why we have to be sort of thread carefully on, the, on, that, uh, on that edge of the knife, right? Um, however, one of the interesting, uh, um, one of the interesting things that, that, that people are coming up to, right? Is uh, for, for instance, the way in which ghrelin is secreted, you have to have an enzyme that modifies the, the molecule to produce the active form of ghrelin. And one of the, the, the mechanisms that we have been trying to work and we're collaborating with uh, uh, Dr. James Hoagland at the University of Syracuse is to create drugs that modulate the enzyme that activates the hormone ghrelin, not necessarily to block, block the receptors in the brain, but at least to decrease circulating levels of ghrelin. Uh, uh, to serve as a, as, a, as a potential way of not completely blocking the effects of ghrelin, but toning them down, right? Reducing the amount of active ghrelin that is secreted uh, uh, through enzyme inhibitors, uh, inhibitors to the enzyme that activates ghrelin. So that's a particular uh, uh, interesting approach. Um, there are approaches where people are actually trying to increase ghrelin, and those are of really high interest to me, because, especially if you're studying anxiety and depression, right? Because um, we, we need drugs that actually may be able to, you know, in, in circumstances where people are, you know, depressed for prolonged periods of time or anxious. Um, we want to, uh, we, we believe that ghrelin is an antidepressant hormone. So we are actually trying to, to test drugs that are able, that are orally taken, right? But that can get into the brain and that can stimulate the ghrelin system um, to, to sort of help fight depression and anxiety. Um, so, so there are blocks in the pipe, there are drugs in the, in the pipeline. Uh, they're both uh, agonist and antagonist that people are trying to play with as well as drugs that play with the enzymes that, that either break down ghrelin or synthesize ghrelin. Um, and uh, hopefully in the next five years, we'll be able to tell you more about that. Another question from the Q&A. Uh, cortisol as a stress marker has a substantial diurnal pattern. Does ghrelin also vary this way? 
under under normal circumstances, yes, there's a circadian pattern of ghrelin secretion, but that pattern, I mean, circadian rhythms are wonky in, in themselves. There's always a circadian rhythm for every hormone, but there are hormones, and especially the feeding hormones, they actually, they can be what we call them trained. Uh, and if you look at ghrelin levels, if you grab humans, right, and you bring them into a lab, and you're conducting, uh, you know, you take samples from these individuals, uh, throughout the day, what you'll find is that ghrelin kind of goes up just before your your time meal. So if you have breakfast, say, at 8 o'clock, lunch at 12, and supper at 7, right, what you'll see is you'll have peaks of ghrelin that precede every single meal at these particular times, right? And, and, and again, this is what some people believe that ghrelin is important for meal initiation, right? Because you have this ghrelin panels that go up at the expected time. There's a psychological aspect to this, right? At the expected time in which you normally get food. Uh, and uh, as soon as you start eating, ghrelin levels go down. You can see this in mice and rats as well. There's a circadian pattern. My mice and rats eat at night. Their ghrelin levels just go up before the lights out. The minute the lights go out, they get really excited and then run around and then they'll eat. But if you change the timing of the meal so that it, the food is only available during the day, their circadian pattern will also sort of change so that you'll see a peak in anticipation of their, their food. Um, so it's very, it's, it varies depending on the experience of the animal. Um, and uh, and uh, in terms of the stressors, uh, ghrelin just seems to go up when, when an animal is chronically stressed, uh, ghrelin levels seem to go up and stay up. And humans as well, we just had a speaker two weeks ago who presented data on the individuals, young, young individuals in, 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 um, uh, in Pakistan who witnessed uh, and who were directly affected by a, a terrorist attack. And uh, these individuals uh, had elevated levels four and a half, uh, of ghrelin four and a half years after the event happened. Um, so, so, so it seems to be that ghrelin is uh, not only a marker for stress, it stays up, and it stays up for a long time, not just, you know, even after the stressor is not there. That leads into the next question in the Q&A, which is in order to tell the difference between normal stress response and chronic stress, my understanding is that after acute stress, cortisol levels return quite quickly to a baseline, while for someone who's chronically stressed, the return is much slower. Does ghrelin behave similarly? And if not, is there some other way to interpret ghrelin levels in a way that differentiates those suffering from chronic stress? Mm -hmm. It's a terrific question. And we don't know. Essentially, we don't know uh, uh, why is it that, that those that have chronic stress show you elevated levels of ghrelin. As you quite rightly said, uh, uh, the court response goes up and within 120 minutes is back to baseline following a stressor, even, even if the animal is, is, is getting this sort of repeated stress response. In fact, what you may see is that the first time you stress an animal, you'll see this big healthy court response that goes down. But after repeated exposure, you see, you know, lower blips. It's almost like the animal is anticipating and that, that negative feedback mechanism is already kicking in before you even start the stress, right? That's what is called, that's what's called allostasis. The set point has to change. There's anticipation. And then um, we believe that ghrelin is actually part of that allostatic response. We think that ghrelin stays up to be able to maintain the, uh, the HPA axis uh, you know, sort of under control uh, to be able to maintain that ability of court to stay down. Uh, so it may be helpful in terms of the negative feedback. Um, what we don't know is what keeps le ghrelin levels high. And, uh, and that's an unknown. We don't know if it's, uh, you know, the, you know, when you're stressed, the stress response is an energetic challenge that depletes you from energy. So it could be just simply an energetic imbalance that is constantly telling your body that, that you don't have enough energy. So ghrelin levels just become chronically elevated, right? Uh, and that that in, in turn influences the stress response. Um, some people suggest that maybe there's a change in, in, in the cells that secrete ghrelin, uh, that is a long-term change, uh, what some people would call an epigenetic change so that the gene that expresses ghrelin becomes activated uh, uh, permanently. Uh, so that it's churning out more of the protein than it normally would. Um, your guess is my guess as well, Michael. It's a great question, though, and that's something that we're investigating. <laughs>
and a question in the chat. I always thought that eating more carbs helped anxiety, stress, because they have a sedative effect. If this is true, is that part of the same process or is it something separate? Well, I think that the sedative effect is due to, uh, again, to the fact that you're, when you're stressed, you're energy depleted. And, you know, the quickest way of replenishing that energy and, and, and the quickest way of dealing with a particular energetic challenge produced by a stressor is to utilize carbohydrates, right? Glucocorticoids, uh, glucocorticoids do this by, by uh, liberating uh, glycogen, gl glucose from glycogen stores in the liver, uh, you know, adrenaline and epinephrine do the same thing from glycogen stores in muscle. So everything is, if you think about it, everything associated with a very with an acute response has to do with the facilitation of glucose and, and its use because you also have an increase in insulin release. So all of these things facilitate uh, glucose and, and ghrelin is not, um, not, as ghrelin goes in and helps with that, uh, um, through the same sort of, through, a, through parallel pathways that involve other hormones, but essentially everything is about using glucose instead of fat, because that's what cells can burn really quickly and cheaply, right? It's not the best way probably uh, of dealing with it. And this in the long term can be not helpful, but in the short term is very, very effective in, in giving you that quick burst in energy. And yes, after, after that, you may feel sedated because you're not um, you, you know, the, 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 the use of glucose is, is immediate, you use it, and then you sort of, you know, you, you, you do get sedated, uh, you get sleepy when you, when you have too many carbs. Uh, you also get opioids, really, opioids, and in, in, it's part of the reinforcing system, you get opioids, that also uh, makes you sedated. So there's a number of different processes in which this could happen, but at the most basic biochemical level, your, net, your cells need energy and glucose is what's going to provide it really quickly. And that's what ghrelin is doing here. Another question in the uh, chat, this one I presume from someone who knows what they're talking about because I'm not sure I know what the question is saying uh, because of the acronyms. But uh, thank you for the awesome presentation, Alfie. You said that there were increased ghrelin receptors in the VTA in people who were stressed. I was wondering if ghrelin receptors dimerize with dopamine receptors in the VTA or the NAC. Mm -hmm. So, 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 there are ghrelin, yeah, so the ghrelin, it's not in human, we haven't seen this in humans, by the way, we've seen this in, in animals that are stressed, uh, there's an increase in, in ghrelin receptors, and yes, uh, you actually don't require, the ghrelin receptors uh, is an interesting protein, it actually doesn't, it's, it's, uh, its activity is usually at 50% of its uh, you know, potential activity, right? It's, we call this constitutive activity. So the receptor is always active, even if ghrelin is not around. And we don't understand, people don't understand how that, that happens, but it's a, it's, a, it's a characteristic of this receptor. And the other thing that is important about this receptor is that whether ghrelin is there or not, uh, this activity, this constitutive activity, allows it to interact uh, at the cellular level with other receptors. So in the VTA, people have found that, uh, and in the nucleus accumbens, people have found that, uh, uh, the, and in the hippocampus and, and hypothalamus, um, but within the, uh, within the hippocampus, we know that uh, ghrelin receptors interact uh, with dopamine D1 receptors, uh, and this interaction is regardless of ghrelin. Right? And one of the things that they do is that they actually enhance the activity of dopamine receptors at the level of the hippocampus. So it's not necessarily that ghrelin needs to be there, but if the receptor is there, uh, uh, you will enhance the activity of the dopamine receptors. And if the receptor is not there, then dopamine receptors can't do its, their thing. So you actually need the ghrelin receptors for the dopamine receptors to function. Um, you have oxytocin receptors in the VTA that interact with the ghrelin receptors. So, so it's a it's a complex uh, it's a complex biology. The receptor itself is is complex, uh, and it also helps us understand that we can think of this system without necessarily thinking of ghrelin as being the most important activator there. Right? You can have the receptor, and the receptor can do its thing without ghrelin being there, um, which is interesting, right? And makes it very beautiful, but very complex. And, and hopefully it'll pay my salary until I retire. Uh, but yes, it's, a, it's an interesting question. 
And then I think in somewhat in follow-up, if individuals have decreased ghrelin receptors in the VTA due to different gene polymorphisms, do you think these individuals will have a more active HPA axis and be more vulnerable to stress and, and anxiety? So, so in human populations, there are different polymorphisms, and some of this have been associated with decreased function of the receptor. Uh, some people have actually uh, uh, tried to see whether these individuals, uh, they, whether their behaviors in terms of overeating or their, their uh, uh, propensity to gain weight is, um, is changed. And uh, there, there are mixed results in the literature. I actually have a student this summer who is going to do a, 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 a review on this, a, a directed review uh, to try to, to, to untangle some of the data because it's, 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 there's a lot of variables that are not controlled in many of these studies. So, so we are, uh, but in collaboration with Robin McQuaid, we're beginning to, to, uh, to, to do studies where we will try to look at uh, the association between some of these polymorphisms and, and anxiety, anxiety and depressive-like uh, uh, symptoms in, in humans. So we hope, again, this is something that we hope to give you more, uh, more an update in, in a science cafe in a couple of years, if, if, if I'm allowed. Uh, but it's an interesting question for sure. And one more tucked in the bottom of the Q&A. My apologies, I missed that one the first time through. Uh, that says, what other hormones does ghrelin threaten? Threaten. Um, I don't think ghrelin is a very friendly hormone. I don't call it threatening. Uh, is that is that is that what Reese threaten? Um, yes, I'm. I'm not sure exactly what's meant. Maybe it's antagonistic to some other hormones. Okay. Okay. So 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 I guess the 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 ghrelin ghrelin is one of many hormones produced by the gut. Uh, and, and what's really interesting, I think that this is why people have paid so much attention to ghrelin. Um, that is because uh, ghrelin, out of all of, all of the uh, probably hundreds of uh, peptides produced by the gut that are important for digestion, for appetite, ghrelin is the only one that increases your appetite. All of the other ones decrease your appetite. But if I, if I may say, if there is, a, a, you know, sort of like a, like a, the, the, the opposite of ghrelin, right? Like if I were to, to contrast uh, uh, hormones, uh, and many of you would probably think that I'm gonna say leptin, but actually no, I'm not gonna say leptin. I'm gonna talk about a hormone called GLP-1, uh, gastrin releasing peptide one, like peptide one. And GLP-1 is actually a, a, a hormone that is in the pipeline for dry. Actually, people are actually testing that uh, analogs to this, to this hormone or peptide for appetite control and, and insulin resistance. One of my colleagues, Jaime Ansman, takes a GLP-1-like drug as a, as a diabetes drug. And that same drug is actually being tested right now for appetite, uh, for curbing appetite and, and weight loss uh, because it has very few side effects of, aside from a little bit of nausea and, 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 and uh, you know, a little bit of a, a sort of anhedonia. Uh, the side effects are, are very mild. So it's actually, a, and, and it does make people lose a significant amount of weight, about five to 6% of the body weight in one year, which is as effective as it can be, right, in terms of drugs. So that would be, a, a, and, and ghrelin and GLP-1 are sort of, when ghrelin is up, GLP-1 is down and vice versa, right? GLP-1 is a satiety drug. It's a drug that stops an appetite. Ghrelin is one that increases appetite. Um, so that would be, you know, if I would, you know, if I was GLP-1, I would certainly feel threatened by ghrelin because, you know, it's the anti-GLP-1. Okay, we seem to have come to the end of our questions and the end of our time in a very nicely synchronized way. I would like to thank Alfie again for a fascinating talk and thank all of our participants for, uh, for coming, for participating, and for joining us at Science Cafe. And I wish you a pleasant afternoon on, for those of you who are here in Ottawa, a balmy and sunny afternoon. And uh, hope to see you at a future Science Cafe online. You can find all of the listings on the uh, Science Cafe site at Carleton. And also, as we were discussing just before the session started, hope to see you at a live science cafe somewhere in what now almost feels like the foreseeable future. So thank you very much for coming. 
and enjoy the rest of your afternoons. And if anybody is, uh, wants to ask me further questions, please feel free to find my email and send me an email. I'm happy to respond to anything else. And we can pass that on through the Science Cafe links as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you all.